<laughs> Be seated, please. I was looking around to see who he was talking about. You know. <laughs> I wasn't sure that was me or what. But, uh, but anyway, hey, when, when, when Pastor Glenn contacted me on Facebook about coming, I was really honored. And, I, and I'm just really, really honored to be here. Uh, you know, I love, uh, I just, I watch and follow you guys uh, on Facebook, and it's just, it's exciting. I watched you as some of you walked down the line of where the building, the new building's going to be, and you prayed over that. I said, oh, I love that idea. I'm going to take that someday. And, um, you know, I just thought that was, that's just tremendous, you know. I follow this guy on Facebook, too, and um, I just wonder how come he doesn't get more, like, hate mail. But anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really, really interesting. And, uh you know, I, I do. I, I, go back a, I go back a long way. I'm, I, I feel really connected to this place in a lot of ways. And uh, is, is, pa is Patty here? She's not here? Uh, you know, Patty, uh, years ago when she was in Norwalk, she hooked, this, she was connected to, there was, a, there was kind of this gang of three. Uh, that was, there was um, Rick, Frank, and Patty. And they were BGMC, Boys and Girls Missionary, now challenged, was crusade back in the day. And they were just maniacs on that. And so I came up with this idea to challenge them to try to beat this other church up in Massachusetts. And they fought it out. And they ended up, they ended up being, I, don't rem I honestly don't remember, it's back in the 80s, but uh, I, think, I think they were either number one or number two. Both these churches were number one and number two in the entire country. It was amazing. It's at records, crazy records that today I think may still stand. So it was amazing. So I always think of Patty when I think of Boys and Girls Missionary Crusade. Anyway, um, you know, I, I just I have a, just a pr real profound appreciation for Pastor Glenn. He is, he's a sharp guy with a passion for God. That blend doesn't always come together. You know that. You know, it doesn't always come. And so it's just... I just appreciate, you know, who he is and what, and what he's done. Uh, you know, I, I was in the, I guess it was the war room. Is that what it's called? The war room. Uh, you know, I'm, I minister to, to naval submariners. Okay, so I saw a war room. I'm like, whoa, you know, I'm looking for, like, buttons to push or something, you know. But, but uh, you know, I've uh, been on nuclear submarines. It's a rather interesting world. But as I'm, as I'm in there, I find this thing. How many of you know what this is? Any of you know what this is? It's lucite plastic, and it's got some scribble notes on this. You know what this is? It's, it's, it's dated December the 4th, 1983. Harvest Time AG, first service is what it says right there. Open your eyes and look at the fields. This has got to have been preached by Pastor Ray, right? Now, I was in a kitchen in Auburn, Massachusetts, and around the table was Hugh Corey, Esther Corey, superintendent and his wife of the then Southern New England District of the Sons of God, and a brand new young couple, Ray and Patty Tate. I was the district youth director. They had come from New Jersey to talk about starting a church in Greenwich. I was in the living room. I was in, I mean, that kitchen having that conversation. I've watched this church since before it was born. And so it's exciting to see all that God is doing. It was just this crazy, crazy idea back in 1983. You know? But look at what's happened. To God be the glory. And now phase two? Wow! Yeah, that's awesome! I feel like I've been here because I, you know, I like follow you guys constantly. I'm like a, I'm one of those stalker types, I guess. But um, any anyway, I, I just I saw that. I just thought I had to bring that out tonight. Tonight with me is my nephew Jared Whipple, and uh, he's just coming from Springfield, Missouri, and we're figuring out how he might connect with what we're with what we're doing. I, I am I do love the I love to plant churches. It is the single most effective way to broaden the kingdom and so uh, we're, we love to do that and we do it in a lot of different kinds of ways but enough about enough about all of that is there uh this is great you guys got this huge clock in the back of the sanctuary 
that there's a glare on it so you can't see it. It's great. I love it. <laughs> All right. Did you know that everybody, let me, let me shift gears here. Did you know that everybody in this room is a mover and a shaker? Did you know that? Yeah. Every single one of you are. Oh, maybe not in the sense of what the world says that you're a mover and a shaker, but every single person in this room is a leader. Every single person in this room, in some sphere of your world, you call the shots. You're a person of influence. You know, I didn't ask you this. I know you guys are live streaming. Is there like a box I have to stay in? Or am I, like, I going to walk outside a box or something? I don't want to like make your life miserable, dude. <laughs> you all right? We just started this live streaming thing at our church, and we're like a bunch of clueless people trying to figure out what to do. They, 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 my guys tell me, you walked out of the box. I'm like, okay. Is, it, is there a box? He's just smiling at me. He said, I guess it's okay, right? All right, all right, okay, okay. Just, just want to make sure. You know, I mean, it's kind of weird. You know, the camera's pointing at nobody. You know, all you hear is a voiceover on the side somewhere. Anyway, let me, let me jump into this and talk to you guys. You know, the Bible is filled with stories about national, political, and spiritual leaders. And it's also filled with stories of people who never thought they'd be a leader, but suddenly from like out of nowhere, they became a leader. And the guy I want to talk to you about tonight was kind of a combination of both. He never intended to be a leader. I mean, he really was not a leader. But God chose this dude and made him a leader of national and far beyond. Significance and consequence. But you got to understand something. When we meet him, when we meet him, he's, the, he's like, he's a nobody. He is the youngest of eight sons. And there's really nothing special about this guy whatsoever, or so it seems, when we, that is when we meet him. Okay? I mean, his big job is to take care of the family's flock of sheep. I mean, that wasn't anything special. I mean, the youngest got that job because nobody else wanted that job. You know, and some of you grew up like that. Okay? You know, he's got that job. Okay? But he rises from that to become, you know, a harp player in King Saul's palace. He, he goes on to kill the famed giant, Goliath. He goes on to become a famed general and eventually king himself. And most of you have figured out we're talking about David now. And along the way, he develops a reputation for not only becoming a phenomenal poet and songwriter, but he creates a catalog of work that's probably more valuable than, you know, Michael Jackson stuff. His catalog is called the Book of Psalms. And you probably sing his material in this church, even though it's 25 years, 2,500 years old. You probably sing his stuff here, you know? But the question that I have for you guys tonight is, how did a nobody become a somebody? How did, how did this guy, I mean, you know, I mean, think of this. What did God see in this guy that caused God to elevate him to, to the place of leadership? I mean, you got to understand something. That, you know, a lot of people get positions and places of power through, you know, they get through posture and manipulation and who, who they know. It wasn't like this, this guy whatsoever. I mean, you know, it's interesting to me, this thing called the birth order. Uh, it's, it's kind of an interest to me. See, I'm the oldest of four sons, okay? And birth order says the oldest is typically... You know, this kind of a task-oriented, driven kind of personality. And that kind of describes me, like, like perfectly. Okay, that's really kind of what I am, who, who, who I am, okay? I mean, typically the oldest child is the position holder, typically, not always. So when the prophet Samuel, you know, when he strode into the little town of Bethlehem uh, under the direction of the Holy Spirit to go anoint a new king, choose a new king, I mean, you know, what would you have assumed? I would assume, like Samuel assumed, you know what? He's going to show up at the house of Jesse, and he's going to pick the oldest dude and anoint that guy as the next king. That would make sense. Now, let's talk about the birth order theory again. In this theory, the babies, I'm not going to ask you how many raise, raise your hand if you're the baby of the family, okay? But the babies, according to this theory, are the ones that, uh, you know, they are easygoing, and I'm not trying to put a label on anybody, but this is just kind of an easy description, okay? They tend to be easygoing. 
disorganized, a tad rebellious, and persistent. And I think we can all figure out why they're persistent. You know, that's what the birth order theory says. What the birth order theory says is, is this, is that you don't choose the youngest one to be the leader. That's what it says. And maybe that's the reason why God chose David, the youngest one. So Jesse lines them all up, and Samuel goes down the line, and God says, no, 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 seven times. And Samuel must have been going, man, I must have made a mistake here somewhere. And finally he goes, is there like another one? He goes, well, yeah, but you don't want that one. He's the youngest one. He's out there. You don't want that dude. And Samuel hears the Lord say to him, don't judge by his appearance or his height. I rejected him. The Lord doesn't look on things the way you see them. No. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. You know? It's interesting what the Lord didn't say there. He didn't say, uh, hey, I know the skills and the personality that are necessary to lead. He didn't say, you know, I called a special search committee together. We checked monster.com and linkedin.com, and we have finally figured out what we want for a... It wasn't any of that. It wasn't any of that. He said, I look at the heart. I look at the heart. And I really appreciate it. I'm not just saying this. I'm saying it because it's true. You know, I really appreciated the worship time tonight. You know, I was really kind of missing Seaport Community Church. But the, the spirit of God is so evident in this place. And the worship of how you guys just embraced that and entered in. And, and uh, you know, the worship bands, you guys were just, you guys were awesome. I was trying to figure out how, how to steal you from here and bring you up to Groton. Uh, but um, you know what? God says, I look at the heart. I look at the heart. And we get this a bit. We kind of get this a little bit when we say to somebody, I love you with my whole heart. You know, or I heart you. You know, we kind of get that. What it means is our emotions are really tied up in, 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 in that thought at that point. But you've got to understand something. That's, that's not quite the full essence of what's being talked about there. The heart, that term the heart is used a thousand times in scripture. And it's interesting, it's used over a hundred times in the book of Psalms. It helps us to understand, David got this understanding of what it means, really, what God was looking for when he said, I'm looking at the heart. I'm looking at the heart. You see, when, when the Bible talks about the heart, this is what it's saying. It's saying all that I am, all my emotions, all my intellect, my moral reasoning, my spiritual center, everything that I am, my conscience, my passion, everything that is, that is my heart. And God says, that's what I'm looking for. The heart. What is also really interesting to me is this. As I look at the story of David, God is doing a leadership assessment. One of the things I used to have to do is I'd have to sit and do these interviews with potential church planters. And I would take them through this paradigm and this grid of try to assess the probability of success as a church planter. And I'd have to assess their leadership ability. And it was an interesting process. But, I, you know, I look at this, and God is doing an, he's done an assessment of David. He's done an assessment of who David really is. And it's inter so interesting to me that God says, I'm looking at the heart, at the heart. And what's happening here, David is about 15 years of age. Oh, I've read he's 25 or 20 or 17. But he's probably around 15 years of age when God says, I look at the heart. God has done a leadership assessment of this man at 15 years of age. And now, although there are plenty of examples, and again, I don't mean to put anybody in any kind of a box, but I do want to say this. It is very interesting to me because I've spent a lot of my life working with teenagers and, and with children that, you know what, many times the tone of our life, the heart of who we are is set in those earliest years. It's set right there. You might find this helpful to understand something, that 85% of people that become Christians do so by age 15. Now, I know some of you didn't meet the Lord until you were in your adult years. I appreciate that. But the fact of the matter is that 85%, continually studies show, 85% of people who come to know the Lord do so before the age of 15. There's a powerful set of implications there. 
for any of us that are in this room here tonight. If, you've got, if you're a parent or a grandparent, you have got a holy obligation to help form that heart so that it has a passion for God. And that's a deliberate and intentional process. You know, I just read an article about why kids leave the church. The typical teenager decides to, the typical person decides to check out of the church by age 14. One of the primary reasons that they do this is because they don't really want to go to a church where they're being entertained by, the, by a youth pastor that's got the next coolest thing. They want a relationship with God, and they want youth leadership in a church that, can, that challenges them that they can do something significant and be significant for God. That's what they want. They don't want party hardy all the time. They don't want that. I mean, you know what? Listen to this. David was sent by his father on a trip to bring food to his brothers and to their commanding officer as they're ready to fight Goliath. It was because he was on a, a mission trip that he encountered the greatest moment of his life. I want to talk about a mission trip. Now, that's a mission trip. Wow. Wow. I've watched you guys online as you've had a very successful VBS just recently, I believe, just the last few weeks. What happens out there in that dome? I know the dome's coming down. What happens out there in those bounce houses? That ain't babysitting. That ain't just something the church should do because well, we should have youth ministry and we should have kids ministries. It's called heart formation. And you're raising up Davids here? By the time they're 15, they're passionate for God? Is that what's happening here? And I'm asking that question to myself. I meet with our youth leadership team tomorrow night, wrestling with some things. You know? Because we've got, we've got to produce a generation you know, please don't ever say to me, oh, you know what, um, you know, I just met Kimmy, or we met Kimmy, I don't know, did we meet or re-meet? Whatever it was, okay. And I met Karen, you know, those two ladies are like, you know, <clears throat> leading the charge. You know, if they come up to you and they go, can you help us? They'll go, well, can I pray about it for three years? <laughs> really? <laughs> why don't you pray about why you shouldn't do it? Right? Kids' ministries, youth ministries is so incredibly important. What you do if you're raising, if you're raising a kid, you know what your kids want? Let me tell you what your kid wants. Your kid doesn't want you to be perfect, but they do want to see you live out your faith. You know? They don't expect you to get it always right, but they want to see where your faith touches the reality of where you live. They want to see you, they want to see how your faith impacts you when you lose your job or your marriage blows up, or you're going through hell. You don't know what you're gonna do, or somebody at the church decides they don't like you, or whatever it is. They want to know, or you know what, or somebody some, does something nasty, or somebody cuts you off on the Merritt Parkway. <laughs> they want to see if your faith is good enough. You want to make a heart for God, let them see how your heart's been touched. Right? I'm walking here all holy. I know how it works. I don't care if it's Greenwich or Grot, it's the same thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. They don't do that here. But they do do it in Groton. We got all the other holy. And the kid's looking at you like, They don't need you to be perfect, but they do need to see the reality of your faith. I grew up in that kind of home. That's the kind of home I grew up in. I saw the reality of my parents' faith. They went through hell, but they never, never, never faltered or wavered. What do you think that did in my heart, in my life? And when I was tempted, when I've been tempted to quit, I thought of some of the stuff of my parents and I said, I ain't going to quit. You put that in my heart. What are you putting in your kid's heart? The famed evangelist of 150 years ago, Dwight L. Moody, who was born, in Northfield, born and died in Northfield, Massachusetts. Last summer I was at his 
famed center up there. This is what he said. If I could relive my, listen to this. If I could, this man traveled the world, held conferences where people from around the world came to. He said, if I could relive my life, I would devote my entire ministry to reaching children for God. What happens on this campus and in Stanford, the ministry to children and youth? Don't ever downplay it because a heart's being created with passion for God. Amen? Amen. Be involved in that. Support it. Help them. Maybe you can't be in a classroom every week, but maybe there's something you can come alongside and do. Amen? Yes. Kimmy, what, can you say amen, Kimmy? All right. You should be standing up like waving at me or something. Okay. You know? Now, she didn't ask me to say that. That's in my notes before I came here tonight. All right? Okay. You know, and she doesn't have to pay me later or nothing. Okay. But here's, let me, let me get through the rest of this quickly. Here's the critical thing. And this, be, and, and Paul preaching, Paul preaching, and it becomes a, a, a passage of scripture that we know all so well. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, Boy, I wish God said this about me. You know, maybe he does, but I don't know. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. When God looks into the depths of your heart, what does he see? I will suggest that you do something really scary. Anybody here a risk taker? Okay, you want a risk to take? Do this. Say, God, show me my heart the way it really is. And then get ready to cringe. Well, you might not, but you might, you know. It's interesting to me, let me bring this back. God is looking for people that don't have mega talents. He's not looking for mega talents and skills. No, David had those, but he wasn't looking for that. He didn't say, yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I got the right set of qualifications here that I got to test every guy against my grid to see if he fits. No, he says, I'm looking for the guy with the right heart. God can give you skills, talents, abilities. But God is looking for two things. He's looking for a heart like or after his. And he's looking. This is what God says about David. He says, I'm looking for a guy that's got the heart. But he says this about him. He says, because I know he'll do everything that I want him to do. This sounds like such simple stuff. Have you ever tried to do everything exactly what God tells you to do when he tells you to do it? You find out you're a lot, a lot like your kids. I used to wonder why in the scripture we're called the children of God. I discovered why. Because we act like kids. We're going to be told 19 times, I need you to go do this. What? Who? Huh? How? Who? What? What was that? <laughs> Your kids do that? Yeah, they, only one of you is honest. Okay, all right. Our kids do that. But we do it too with God. But he's saying, I'm looking for a guy that's going to do everything that I want. But really, what is the heart of God? Look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, to love your neighbors yourself. You know what? What God is looking for in our heart is this, is to, is to love what he loves. There's a song that kind of like sounds like that. And I, 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 because I love you, I'm not going to attempt to sing it. You know, that would be bad. And anybody watching online, they'll immediately disconnect. But what does is, what is God love? God loves, you know, I mean, he wants us to love what he loves, to value what he values, to pursue what he pursues. And David became known for this, did he not? 150 psalms. Well, he didn't write them all, but, but most of the psalms, I mean, he, he, he writes these. And I mean, they're filled with worship and praise. They're filled with intimate expression to God. Have you ever read those things carefully? They're amazing. I mean, he's honest and open. It's, it's amazing. I mean, he's just a passion for God that motivates him to do more than he wants, the more than anything else. I mean, he wants to, he wants to worship God and he writes this stuff down. And he says, God, I want to build a great building for you. I want to do this awesome thing. God says, ah, no, not you, dude. I don't want you doing it. Your son can do it, but not you. And you can read that as to why all that came down. 
but it provoked him to bring the Ark of the Covenant, that national symbol of God's presence that was hanging out at the home of Obed-Edom. He says, I got to get that thing because I got to have the presence of God where I am. Yeah. You know what? You need, you know what? I get the vibe from this place. You guys want the presence of God. Yeah. I mean, a beautiful building is cool. That's great. That's awesome. You know, awesome abilities and ministries and all that's all cool. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's the presence and the power of the living God that changes our hearts. I've been in some amazing buildings that were mausoleums. God hadn't been in that place in a long time. You know what? I said, God, I, I want to be. I want you here. I want you here. And I was, you know, Pastor Nick, you know what? God laid upon my heart. We just we took everything and just shoved it off to the side for five weeks. And I told my associate, I said, on Wednesday night, I just want you to run prayer meetings. On, on Wednesday night, you know, we have our leadership team for our new London church. To, they, they meet, and then my, my biker church team meets. But I said to my associate, I said, look, we're, for five weeks, we're just going to gather and we're going to pray. Because we need the power and the presence of God. Because we cannot do this in our own ability. It can't happen. And you know what? You're not going to build that second phase in your own strength. You can forget it. I asked Pastor Glenn, I said, Is there, are there any topics I should stay away from when I'm preaching? He said, only one, don't, don't split the church. <laughs> that would be really bad if I did that. Well, all you have to do is go, he's some nutcase from two hours up the road. We don't have to ever see him again. Let's not worry about it, you know? But in all seriousness, in all seriousness tonight, it is the power and the presence of God. And it's, and it's you know what? I came out of a meeting one night and a guy said to me, well, you'll never be a diplomat, will you? I've never seen this guy before in my life. Because I tend to be kind of like, kind of like straight and direct. I built a building. I, I, know, I know this drill real well. Here's the point though. And there's going to be a congregational meeting and special services. And that's so cool. It's awesome. It's amazing. And it's wonderful. But at the end of the day, it's got to be God, you allowing God to get your heart. Right? Because that's what God's looking for. He ain't looking for buildings. He's looking for hearts. Is that right? Who are you? Hi, Chris. Good to meet you. I spent 10 years in youth ministry, and I've, I've never been mentally well since. <laughs> and then I spent years in church planting. That really does you in. Anyway, you know what? God is not looking for people that are perfect. He's looking for people that pursue him. I honestly cannot see what that clock says. Can you tell me what time it is? It's 8.15. I honestly can't read that. That's a, one, it's a wonderful thing. I'm going to get one of those for our church because I can say there's a clock in the back of the building, but nobody can read it, so it's okay. Let me keep going here. David's pride, David's pride led him to trust his own military might rather than the power of God. And it brought all kinds of punishment into his life. His idleness led to temptation which led to a full-blown affair with Bathsheba. You ever want to get a perspective? If you're here, This is what I tell my folks. So I'm not telling you anything I don't tell the folks at Seaport. And you know what? Pray for the people at Seaport because they have to put up with me every week. But here's the thing. You know, pray for Jared. I don't know why he'd come back from Springfield to Missouri to work with his uncle. God help him. But think, here's David. If you're ever tempted to have an affair... Think of David. In chapter 11, 2 Samuel, we see he has this affair. 
But then read chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, and you'll see the pain and the suffering that he went through for that affair. Put this in your head when you're tempted to have an affair. For some reason, I'm supposed to say this tonight, and I don't know if it's because you guys are, you know, the one person that's watching online. And um, <laughs> to me, anyway. I've counseled lots of couples that have had affairs, and it takes two to four years minimum to recover. If you recover. Don't let the devil fool you. Don't let the devil fool you. Oh, the pain I've seen. Anyway. Anyway. But even that, you know what? David blew it. But God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people that pursue him. You know what? David had major wins and major failures. A heart for God doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't give you an excuse. But at the same time, you know what? It, out of that pain and out of that sorrow and out of that horrendous mistake comes Psalm 51 where David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. It was because he had a heart. Even though he made a horrendous mistake, he had a heart for God that drew him back. He paid dearly for that mistake. Dearly. But the heart brought him back. Brought him back. Let me just, I'm, trying, I'm standing up here trying to figure out how to condense the rest of this message. Let me just try to get this down here. A couple of closing thoughts and we can respond. One of the things that I've learned about having a heart for God is that there, aren't a short, there are no shortcuts for that. Time in God's presence equals love and effectiveness. I can see this clearly in my own life, friends. When I spend time, and I said this to my church just recently, when I spend time in the presence of God, I'm empowered to love you more. When I don't, my love, this is the same to my own church, my own love for you, it ebbs. It becomes about doing the job. Time in the presence of God it just infuses me and infuses us with love and effectiveness. You know, and for David, I mean, that was something that must have been developed early on. I mean, day after day and night after night, out there being alone, out there in the field. And I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Have you ever been, maybe you've gone on vacation somewhere where there isn't a lot of light pollution and you notice like there's like all the stars in the sky like popping out. Ever, have you ever had that experience? Or maybe out on the ocean or something like that? Okay. Can you imagine? Can you imagine him out in the field and there's no lights whatsoever anywhere? And he sees the glory of God. And it's probably in that experience, probably in that experience, it causes him to later to write Psalm 8, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And Psalm 19 that says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. I mean, you know what? That time that he spent waiting on God just released those gifts and that, a power, that power to love and the power to worship. There aren't any shortcuts there. I mean, all this seems so contrary to a, oh, oh, what can I tweet world? You know? Who? Oh, what can I put on Facebook? You know? Who? Oh, what can I get on Instagram? You know? I just read something about, I better not say that. I might make somebody feel bad. But, you know, that there's some, some sort of psychosis with the, 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 the constant use of selfies. But anyway, I'm not saying it's true. I just read that. Okay. I mean, you know, we can't go anywhere without our smartphone. You know, hypocrite that I am. Um, I've got to have that thing everywhere. You go out of the house, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I've got my phone. We're so glued to that thing. To try, we can't spend any time with God waiting for the next text message. Some of you have probably been tweeting from the service. You'd never believe this guy they brought in tonight. Thankfully, it's the last one. <laughs> but 
But the time with God is that which creates a heart. It releases and empowers love. It releases creativity. It enables worship. It enables you to come in here and not wait for the band to sing just the right song that you like. I know how it works. You know? I just discovered that my effectiveness and just honoring and loving the Lord is so, so tied into time I spend with him. I didn't say sleeping in prayer. I, I, I mean, I talked about really learning to be with him. A heart after God. It yearns to spend time with him. It has a passion to follow his plans. It has faith to trust him. It's kept free and pure. I'm almost done here. I'm going to blast through the rest of this. Because I, I think we need to kind of get to the end here and, re, and respond to this a little bit. When you have a heart after God, and you, you read, just look up, go to something like uh, Version or Bible Gateway, and just look up heart in, 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 in the book of Psalms. And it brings up all these, all this, a hundred listing, a hundred um, usages of that term, at least, of heart. And, and, and David talks about his heart in a lot of ways. But it's interesting to me, a man with a heart after God, this is the same guy that not once, but twice, King Saul took a spear and flung it at the dude and tried to kill him. You know what's amazing to me? Is that he kept his heart pure. I think if that was me, I would have gone, ha, I would have pulled the thing out of the wall and threw it back. Keep your heart pure because when somebody throws a spear at you, you don't have to throw it back. Here's a simple formula. The more you spend time with God, the more you want to spend time with him. The less time you spend with him, the less time you want to spend with him. Now, I could tell you, I could talk to you about leadership all day long, easy. And David was a leader. He was a visionary. He was a risk taker. He was a strategic planner, and he was very persistent. The baby was, he had it going on. And it's interesting what it is said of David. He cared for them with a true heart and led them with skillful hands. But this is what God says. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Why does God elevate a man, a woman, who has his heart? Because the heart of God is people first. It's mercy. It's patience. What's the heart of God? It's passion. It's faithfulness. What's the heart of God? The heart of God is trustworthy, loyal, and truthful. God is looking for people who have a heart like his, a heart or a heart after him, that values what he values, that yearns for what he yearns for. I want to close. And can the band, would you guys be so kind to come back, please? I love your ministry. I appreciate it. I'm sure you guys probably came in earlier, came in, had a, had a rehearsal or however it works, and you've invested time tonight to be here and to, and to, and to play with skillful hands. And so thank you. It's appreciated. Love, love your voice. Awesome. My wife's a worship leader. Plays piano, you know. So, you know, I just love what you guys are doing, so keep doing it, all right? It's awesome. Jeremiah wrote this. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? And David wrote this. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from hidden faults. There are leaders in the room, and God wants to choose you and move you to a place of greater significance for Him. But it doesn't start here in your hand or here in your mind, it starts in your heart. As we close tonight, If, 
it's if this is okay, and I'm 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 probably I'm giving you sound guys fits. So I apologize. I would like all of you who would who would like to. I'd like to have you come and just stand across the front. I, I, it's probably not an unusual thing for you to do. It, it, you, don't, you don't have to, but for all of you who'd like to. And before you come, let me tell you why I want you to come. I want you to come, and I want you just to stand here, and I want you to simply say, God, I want a heart after you. Show me your heart. I don't want, I don't ask, I don't, I don't try to look at my heart. I say, God, show me my heart because my heart's deceitful, and I will trick myself. I will excuse myself. I'll fake myself out. God, I, I, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say I'm good enough or I'm terrible or I got it all going on or I don't have nothing going on or I'm the greatest or I'm the worst. I can't get it right. God, show me my heart. Show me who I am. And it's amazing what happens. Sometimes God goes, we got to deal with that. And sometimes I'm thinking, God, why'd you pick me? And I'll feel like all lousy about myself. And God will say, and then God will speak life in me. It's never, con- it's never condemning. No matter how stern it is, it's always uplifting. Amen? So for all of you who want to, let's take just a few moments. And why don't you come up here, and let's just open our hearts, all of you who want to. And just let's just do this. God, you, you want to elevate me. You want to increase the sphere of my influence. Don't lock into what you think that is. Don't even, I, I don't think about what that is. Just say, God, that's what you want to do. Let me, let me just stand over here because I'm bumping into you guys. And just as we take just a few moments, and then I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Nick. Let, let's just open our, our minds and our hearts and just say, God, show me my heart. There are some of you here that think you're like worthless and no good, and God's going to say to you, uh, no, that's wrong. You're my child whom I have sacrificed all for, and I see incredible things. And the future I have for you is amazing. God's going to say that to some of you. And there are some of you, there are some of you, thank you, there are some of you that maybe God needs to go, let's deal with that. And there may be some of you that God just needs to come in and really show you There's some attitudes that you've allowed to creep in. They're going to kill you. They're going to keep you. They're going to to allow you to excuse yourself or whatever. But Father God, right now, open our hearts and help us by your Holy Spirit to see what our heart really is. God, we don't want to deceive ourselves. Your Holy Spirit's at work right now. God, for those of us that maybe we've, we've been condemning ourselves, we need to knock that off and there's some of us Lord that we maybe we just need a little check for reality and we need you need to deal with something in our heart you guys just play the Lord told me just to shut my mouth I'm going to do that as they play let's listen to the Lord Speak to us even now, Lord. We yearn for you. Purify our hearts. Cleanse our hearts of God. Every attitude that we've allowed to creep in, that God, that really is not honoring to you, we want to lay it down. 